Uh, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for waiting uh, for an hour. We were meant to have started one hour earlier. Uh, but then uh, Rajarshi, you must have noticed, sent out a very discreet notice announcement to say that for unavoidable reasons, we will start one hour late. Now, the reasons were not exactly unavoidable. Um, in fact, this morning when I was preparing for today's uh, lecture uh, and thinking about the Protestant ethic and the duty of uh, labor, work as a calling and so on, I decided that even though there was this uh, important football match this evening, we should nevertheless uh, continue as scheduled because this, after all, is our calling. But um, uh, somewhat, uh, we were put, I was put into this difficult situation because the match turned out to be a very exciting and unpredictable one. And uh, I thought it would be uh, unfair to deprive all of you of the opportunity of actually watching the match. So um, Rajeshi very kindly agreed that we would start one hour late. I hope this, is, this was a, uh, an acceptable decision for all of you. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> let us... Um, move to our topic today. Uh, we will discuss uh, Weber's um, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which, as you know, um, is a very uh, famous, controversial uh, book over which there's been a huge amount of debate and discussion over the years. We will uh, refer to some of this, these debates uh, in the course of this evening. Uh, so it's also interesting because uh, we will uh, have a chance to actually compare two very pioneering uh, sociologists, uh, Durkheim and Weber, Weber today, uh, on the role of religion in uh, the emergence of capitalism uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, Durkheim next week on his understanding of religion as a universal system, as something that <coughs> all human societies have, uh, and what are the specific characteristics of uh, religion as a universal feature of, of, of human life. Uh, we will look at, uh, you know, these two um, extremely foundational uh, studies uh, in modern uh, sociological analysis. Uh, so let's let's turn to uh, Weber. Hmm. Sorry. Okay, so Weber, uh, he, um, as you can see, he um, died, well, at the age of 56, but uh, in that period of his, uh, of his career, within those years, he produced a vast amount of writings, and many of them are uh, still remain absolutely foundational in terms of the, uh, the, the grounding of modern sociology, uh, in terms of the methods of sociology and specific areas in which uh, he, he worked. Um, in fact, um, the, uh, this particular book was first published uh, as a long essay 
in in the journal in 1904-5, uh, and then uh, it was published as a book uh, in an expanded form in 1920, just soon before Weber's death, in fact. Uh, and that's the time when he added an introduction. And if you've noticed the introduction, he uh, he actually uh, replied to various um, criticisms that had been made of this book uh, and his main sort of argument in the book. Um, so we will we will look at some of these um, discussions uh, in a minute. Uh, but <clears throat> one of the things he mentions within in this introduction is that the uh, there is this particular uh, uh, intervention uh, is part of a larger project uh, that Weber undertook. Uh, and this larger project, uh, he was unable to finish, uh, but, uh, but several parts were published. And as you can see from the list of things that were actually published, Weber was actually looking at, looking comparatively at the religious, cultural, ideological, uh, background or situations that existed in different parts of the world. Uh, and he, he looked at this comparatively with this central question in Weber's mind. Why was it that modern capitalism and most of the other institutions and practices of modernity emerged in Western Europe and not anywhere else? This was his main question, right? He was trying to explain why capitalism and modernity emerged in Europe. And he was looking for the realm of ideas, looking at the realm of ideas, uh, at, at cultural uh, notions, at, at presuppositions uh, and beliefs. Uh, that were held um, by societies, uh, which, according to Weber, could be uh, identified as making it possible for modern capitalism to emerge. Uh, so uh, he published uh, The Religion of China, The Religion of India, Ancient Judaism, as well as a, a more theoretical uh, book, still regarded as extremely important, the sociology of religion, which, which was a, a more general theoretical um, analysis that he made of uh, the sociological foundations and, uh, um, and the sociological aspects of religion. Uh, <clears throat> so, as I said, the key question was, what are the unique features of Western capitalism not found anywhere else? The key feature that Weber identified, and these, this key feature, this is something that Weber will investigate and, uh, and, and expand on in a whole series of works through his life. Uh, and that is, the rationalization of activity in almost all spheres of life. Rationalization. And we will see what Weber means by rationalization. Uh, so, irrational chemistry has been absent from all areas of culture except in the West. And this is the key premise. Uh, you might even say, it's 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 he 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 asserts it, and then he claims this is the finding that uh, everyone must accept after comparatively looking at um, the uh, the cultures of major uh, civilizations around the world. So what's unique? And these are the specific elements uh, that Weber identified. 
rational jurisprudence law. And he specifically cites the body of understood as Roman law, uh, which emerged in the late Roman Empire and then subsequently uh, was <coughs> um, formalized uh, in various um, juristic uh, texts in, uh, in medieval Europe. And then there was canon law, which is the law of the Catholic Church. Uh, but these were rational uh, legal uh, corpuses, right? Uh, rational as distinct from arbitrary. Rational as distinct from arbitrary. So there is an entire logical system operating through the body of laws. This is what's rationalization in terms of the legal system. So this is what emerges in Europe uh, through the medieval and late medieval time into the early modern period. Uh, <clears throat> there is very interestingly, Weber compares the musical systems of different civilizations. He actually speaks of, of, of Chinese music, Indian music, uh, and then he argues that the rational harmonious music, harmony is the crucial thing as distinct from melody. The, the forms of harmony, which are of course uh, mathematically arranged. So there's an entire sort of completely mathematical structure to the harmony, the harm, harm, harmonical system, you might say, of uh, Western music, Western classical music. And this, Weber argues, is, is an aspect of the rationalization of, as he says, all aspects of culture, including something like music. All right. Rational architecture, the Gothic vault, dome, style, uh, all of this. Um, I mean, he is not simply making these sort of ideological claims as such. He actually goes into the technicalities of comparing, for instance, European architecture, Gothic, as compared to Islamic architecture, which he also recognizes um, was extremely well developed. What was lacking was a system of rational thinking, a system of rational structural thinking uh, into the, uh, the techniques. Uh, the materials, all of these combined that would produce a rational science of architecture uh, in Europe. This is what he is distinguishing from other kinds of architecture and other uh, systems of architecture in other civilizations. Uh, the rational use of printing for widely circulated literature. He is making the distinction from Printing as such, which of course, as we know, was first uh, invented and 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 uh, uh, employed on a large scale in China, right? So it wasn't printing that was uh, discovered in in uh, Europe. But once printing or the technique of printing comes to Europe, what happens in Europe is, of course, as we know, the spread of the printing industry and a huge publishing uh, enterprise uh, for the wide circulation of literature through the medium of print. This did not happen, although in, as, as, as uh, Weber points out, that even though printing was well known in China and actually the techniques were understood in China, this never led in China to this kind of wide circulation of printed literature. Rational bureaucracy. This is a subject that Weber will come back and discuss at great, much greater length in, in other works, which Weber re, uh, regards as the key feature of the modern state, a rational bureaucracy, a state with a written constitution. This, of course, is something that happens with the French and the American uh, revolutions in the late 18th century. Continuous rational 
capitalistic enterprise with separation of business from the household, rational bookkeeping, and rational organization of free labor. We will consider these elements at greater length later on uh, in this um, uh, discussion. Uh, but this, of course, is clearly what Weber is identifying as the feature of modern capitalism, which emerged in Europe, but did not emerge in other places. Even though, as, as Weber will point out, there were merchants, there were major accumulations of merchant capital, there was large-scale trade, all of these things existed. But nowhere else was only in Europe that this led to something that we identify as modern capitalist enterprise. And Weber's key question is, how did this happen? What explains this unique development in Europe? Okay, so these are the broad features of modern Western capitalism, which Weber identifies. This is an entire complex. There are clearly, Weber is suggesting they're all related one to the other. It is an entire culture that is rationalized. And this is what characterizes modern Western capitalism. So what is the key question? The main question addressed in the Protestant ethic is what is the uh, yes, what is the key feature of sober bourgeois capitalism and the Western bourgeois class? Now, what is the origin of this bourgeois capitalism? This book addresses only one side of the causal chain. Now, you have to be careful because this has led to a lot of debate uh, on the basis of a misunderstanding of Weber's project. Weber says very clearly that this is only one side of the causal chain, namely the influence of religious ideas on the spirit or ethos of the economic system called capitalism. There is another side. Right, but this Weber is not addressing here. This other side is addressed in a series of studies on other world religions in countries where the modern capitalist system did not emerge. Okay, so in this particular book, Weber is discussing specifically the causality that can be identified in Western Europe which leads to the emergence of modern capitalism, you have to explain why, despite many of the same conditions being present, capitalism did not emerge in the other uh, major cultural areas of the world. And that is something Weber has addressed. And, and as he said, this is the larger project, China, India, uh, he addresses uh, Judaism. He had a project to consider the Islamic world. Uh, so that's the other, other side. He also points out that he does not use any ethnography. This is an interesting uh, point that he's making. Because by this time, by the late 19th century, there is a lot of ethnographic material from different parts of the world on religion, religious practices, culture, uh, et cetera, et cetera, on the behavior of, of, of traders, merchants, um, all of these sorts of things. I mean, there's a fair amount of tra travel material, uh, the actual sort of works of anthropologists and so on. All of this is already there. Weber does not use this. And he says, he. He only uses texts. And that is because he is dealing with the religious ethics of classes, which were the culture bearers of their countries. No, so effectively then Weber is suggesting that he is concerned here mainly with those relatively wealthy and intellectually uh, advanced 
sections of societies which you can identify as the uh, agents of capitalism or capitalist enterprise, right? And so, so these are classes which were the culture bearers of their countries and their thinking, their, the ideas they propagated uh, are to be found in the relevant texts. So that is what Weber is looking at here. So once again, you have to be careful uh, because Weber is very careful here in, in specifying what are his sources, uh, what, are, what is the specific question that he is addressing and the specific part of the project that he is carrying out in this particular book, okay? So empirically, what is it that has to be addressed? Owners of capital, skilled laborers, and technically trained personnel in modern enterprises are overwhelmingly Protestant. So he actually gives certain, uh, even some uh, quantified uh, proportions of population and so on and so forth from different kinds of studies and reports in Europe, what he's, suggest, what he's, uh, what he's uh, pointing out is that in Europe, even though many of these countries have Catholic or other uh, populations of other uh, religions, but owners of capital, skilled laborers, okay, not, not all laborers, but skilled laborers, and technically trained personnel, in modern enterprises are overwhelmingly Protestant. This could not be because the Reformation brought freedom from medieval social constraints, since Protestant churches imposed even stricter religious discipline. Now, in a sense, what he is contesting here is an easy uh, sort of parallel from the claim that the Reformation brought about a certain freedom of thinking, right? Uh, from you know the medieval uh, scriptural and theological uh, beliefs of the Catholic Church, and and of course the um, orthodoxy of the of the uh, church, the, the priests, uh, and this produced somehow a kind of atmosphere of of free thinking, of free activities, and this led to capitalism. He is contesting this because what he's suggesting, and he will, this is, will be a major part of what he will show, is that the Protestant churches imposed even stricter religious discipline, right? So it's not that the Protestant churches, especially the ones that, that, that Weber identifies with the early um, capitalist entrepreneurs, those, had, those churches, those Protestant reform churches, had extremely strict rules of religious discipline, even stricter than the Catholic Church. So one cannot simply claim that there was suddenly a kind of uh, a free flourishing of ideas. Catholics, even when skilled, tend to remain in traditional occupations, while minorities, because of their exclusion from traditional positions, take up commercial activity. Of course, uh, Weber is particularly pointing to the uh, Jews in Europe who, uh, who were barred from a lot of occupations, such as uh, owning of land or joining the army and so on. They were they were left, they were kept out. And so <clears throat> they tended to move into commercial activities. Uh, but Catholics tended to remain in traditional occupations. And uh, <clears throat> Weber will identify a, a, what he will call traditionalism as a major obstacle that capitalism would have to fight in order to establish itself. So, 
Again, he is contesting here, you might say, a more uh, a general misperception uh, about uh, the role of religion in the emergence of capitalism. He is saying that otherworldliness, asceticism, and piety are not Catholic traits abolished by the Reformation. Right? Anyone who suggests that would be making a mistake. Because there is a strong relationship between otherworldliness, asceticism, and piety, and the economic entrepreneurship of Protestants. This is his key argument, right? That the, the Protestant ethic, as he will describe it, actually consists of asceticism, piety, strict codes of moral discipline, right? On the practical activities of humans. So it is not uh, an argument that the Reformation brings about um, you know, the end of religious orthodoxy. And so this creates the conditions for capitalism. That is not, in fact, the correct uh, analysis. It would be a, a misidentification uh, of the causes of, um, of capitalism. This will be his main argument, okay? And he will do this uh, through the empirical uh, examples uh, and, and the evidence that he will find from the texts of the major Protestant um, you know, theoreticians, you might say. So what is the spirit of capitalism? And here he goes to a very interesting uh, personality, and that is Benjamin Franklin in, in, uh, in the United States, what would become the United States. <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin, who, of course, many of you would know, uh, was himself a kind of scientist, inventor, uh, but also an entrepreneur, and a major political figure, diplomat uh, in the new United States uh, administration. Uh, so Ben Franklin, he wrote a book, the autobiography, his autobiography, which became a kind of, uh, you might even say, a kind of uh, textbook of a new moral, a textbook for moral education uh, for the new capitalist entrepreneur. So based on this text, Weber is identifying what he believes is an ideal type, and we will have to look at this um, concept more carefully because it is one of Weber's fundamental um, contributions. <clears throat> As distinct from, and I will point this out once more, uh, Durkheim, who talks about the social fact as the average or the normal, right? Because for Durkheim, it was not interpretation that was important. Right? For Durkheim, what was important was to identify what actually exists, to identify social facts as things, as objects, almost like natural objects. Right? And for that, Durkheim said, you have to go out into the real world and find out what is the normal, the average, which is the one that tends to happen most often in large numbers, as it were, okay? Weber is not following that same method. In fact, Weber's method is interpretive, right? Weber wants to actually construct, conceptually, to construct an ideal type. And the ideal type is a historical individual that becomes typical. So the distinction is between an average and the typical. We will have to consider carefully what is the difference. Is, is the average not typical? And Weber would say no. 
the average is not the one that happens most often is not necessarily typical. The typical is an ideal, right? This is what everyone should aspire to. This is what everyone would be instructed or educated to become like. And that is the ideal. And yet that ideal is a historical individual, right? A historical individual. Uh, you will have to identify like a character like Ben Franklin in, in North America <clears throat> in this period, in sort of revolutionary America. Uh, America on the verge of a new capitalist future. And this is an ideal type, which is a historical individual that becomes typical in illustrating a concept, and the concept being the spirit of capitalism here. So what does Franklin um, say? Franklin writes down a set of instructions on how one should carry out one's life, okay? And they illustrate, Weber says, the typical ethos of West European and North American capitalism. Now, they are not utilitarian or hedonistic. In other words, Franklin is not saying do this because that's the most useful thing to do. You will get results. He is not saying do this because it will give you pleasure or you will be happy. That is not what Franklin is saying. In fact, as Weber will keep insisting that these principles or instructions are, will often seem to be quite irrational. They will be quite irrational. Judging from a distance, judging as an outsider, you will think, why on earth should anyone want to be like this or behave like this or act like this? There seems to be almost no reason for it. And yet that is what the instruction will be. Right? And what is this ethos? It involves an obligation. It is one's duty in a calling. We will come to this concept of the calling, right? One is called, as it were, by God to follow a particular occupation or a particular kind of work. That is something that God calls somebody into doing. And so, because it is a calling, it is one's duty and obligation to follow that calling, the calling of that profession. Now, Faber's question is, how does this apparently irrational duty become a general ethos. This needs to be explained. Okay, so be very careful in understanding what Weber is identifying as requiring an explanation. Weber is suggesting that the ethos of capitalism, the basic, you might say the emotional motivation, the, the motivation in terms of ideas, for someone to become a capitalist, or in fact, as they would say, to become even a laborer within a capitalist system, right? That key idea that will drive people into it actually is an irrational desire. This irrational desire is followed because people accept it as a religious duty. And hence Weber's claim that you require a religion because this is not a simple utilitarian thing that people realize that if one does this, one would become wealthy, all right? Or one would 
get a livelihood. That is not the way in which capitalist accumulation will take place, because as Weber would, would show very clearly, right, that capitalist accumulation does not mean you consume what you earn. That is absolutely not what the capitalist does. The capitalist cannot and must not consume what uh, his profits. So what is it that will um, drive capitalists to behave in this way? This irrational duty as an obligation must become must be shared by lots of people for capitalism to emerge as the general system of production in a society. How does this happen? And Weber's argument is this can only happen if there is a religious movement based on this idea, which acquires a certain um, spread in that society. And Weber's claim is this happens only in Western Europe or North America. It does not happen anywhere else. Okay. Questions? Because I will now go to Weber's specific thesis, main argument. And any questions up to this point? Uh, can I ask a question, sir? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you in the previous slides you talked that that he was uh, whoever by looking into uh, uh, Ben Franklin's autobiography he tries to find out the idle type. This idle type is not the same as uh, the Durkheim's average social average. Yeah. But when we we'll see that uh, this 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 uh, this idle needs to also become a general one, a general ethos. So there is it not very much sim similar to Durkheim's model that this idol has to become general. This See, the, 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 the difference, the dif yes, the difference is this, that the general ethos is not the same as a general practice, right? What becomes general is the desire. It is the ideal which becomes general. Everyone accepts that that is what I must be. It does not mean that everyone is equally successful in, in, in carrying out that obligation. All right? Durkheim's argument would be, or method would be, forget about the idea, right? Forget about what Ben Franklin claims. That is merely an ideological claim, right? You have to go to the actual uh, practices in North American society at the time and find out what ordinary people were actually doing, right? And if one were to do this, it is very obvious. It, I mean, you will know that not everybody was actually behaving in the way that Franklin was uh, instructing them, right? Everybody was not uh, successful in living up to that ideal of Franklin. Correct. So if you follow Durkheim's method, you will not come to the conclusion that in North American society, there is a general practice, right, of following the obligation or duty of a calling. That is not the general, general practice. Weber's argument is that that is not what is the relevant uh, causal factor. We will have to find the, re the relevant causal factor, one, in the culturally dominant classes, right? The leaders of society. What are their ideals? What are their ideals? What is it that they are instructing others to do? And that is key in terms of bringing about a cultural change. Right. In fact, what Weber would suggest, what is what is crucial, and if you go back to our discussion on Durkheim, you see, in terms of Durkheim's uh, argument of normality, then, as Durkheim kept repeating, there is an inbuilt 
tendency in Durkheim system to privilege the status quo, to privilege what actually the, uh, privilege the existing practices. Durkheim would actually find it hard to explain why there are significant changes, sometimes very quick and drastic. In fact, Durkheim discounts the possibility of quick and drastic changes. Um, so uh, in Durkheim, because of his tendency to emphasize actual normal, actual average practice, actually prevailing uh, average practices, Durkheim's method will lead you to emphasizing a very slow process of change of culture. Cultural values do not change quickly. Whereas Weber is suggesting that because of the quick spread of religions like Puritanism, Calvinism, and so on, not among a general mass of the population, but among a significant section of cultural leaders, that is what changes traditionally. That is what changes the tradition. So that's the key difference between Durkheim and Weber, right? So the difference between the normal and the ideal is lies there. Uh, Durkheim, uh, Weber is privileging the ideal because he thinks, he thinks his argument is that you will have to look for what is it, what is the force that is new here? That will break the normal, right? This is what what the difference is. Clear? Okay. Uh, so Weber's basic thesis then is: for economic competition and individualism to become the norm. So, the finally, what will happen with the change then? Once the ideal type gets accepted as the desirable um, ethos, okay? This will lead to economic competition and individualism to become the norm, okay? Now, for that to happen, it must exist not in, iso in isolated individuals, but must become the common way of life of a whole group. When that happens, Durkheim's method would become applicable again, and you will say all of this, you know, uh, competition, economic competition, individualism is in fact the norm. That is normal. But what explains the historical change from a traditional way of thinking to this form? What explains, how will you explain the change in the norm? This is Weber's question. So Weber actually advances two different theses, right? Even when he does not explicitly say so. One is the origin of the particular orientation to modern capitalist activities, which lies, sorry, one is the origin, sorry. The origin of this particular orientation. And that is where the ideal type argument is crucial. Okay. How, where does this change, the force of change, come from? And the second is that there is a specific set of religious beliefs, and this spirit and idea was causally effective. So one is the origin, and secondly, this ideal or spirit to show that this is causally effective in the rise of modern capitalism, modern Western capitalism. You have to show both of these things. One is where does it originate? What is this idea which forces or moves to change the norm? Because the previous norm was a traditional way of life. That must be changed. Where, where does that force come from? That's the first thing. And Weber's answer is that comes from a set of religious beliefs. Second, he will also attempt to show 
that this spirit was causally affected. It caused the rise of modern Western capitalism. Okay? So what is it that existed before traditionalism? And here Weber points out that capitalism in different forms, you know, merchants, what he is calling adventurer capitalism. So uh, attempts to become wealthy or based on sometimes even the use of force, coercion, right? You have lots of examples of, of uh, you know, uh, bands, uh, including sort of rubber bands, or essentially using the techniques of banditry to amass wealth. Uh, uh, adventure capitalism in different forms, it has existed in many different societies. But, and this is a key feature of traditionalism, pure money-making and getting ahead of others was always looked down upon. Most societies did not approve of one or two people among many suddenly becoming wealthy and claiming to be superior to others, right? There was always in most societies a traditional way of life which did not encourage this. In fact, most traditional societies you will find, including uh, most sort of social arrangements in India or cultural arrangements in India, where, for instance, it was understood that somebody who made a lot of money, there was somehow an obligation to share that wealth with others. So, for instance, even today you have the custom of throwing a feast. In fact, there would be pressure. Let's say if somebody who's won a big lottery or something, or suddenly made a certain, um, a lot of money somewhere. In any sort of rural society or within some community, there would be pressure on this person to share that wealth and not keep it for himself and his own family, right? And the usual way of doing this was, was throwing a feast, a big festival, uh, sometimes charity, right? Uh, so this is tradition. The strongest mental obstacle which the bourgeois capitalist economy had to overcome was traditionalism. Traditionalism meant, for instance, regarded taking care of the traditional needs as sufficient. Additional income was not worth the additional effort. So just as on the one side, you have this um, constraint on making, uh, on money making, right? That a lot of profits suddenly made had to be shared. That was the obligation, right? It was in a sense, an attempt to prevent the differentiation of society into classes, right? So that suddenly you did not have the emergence of a new wealthy section suddenly emerging and becoming powerful over the rest, Be you know, become becoming exploiters of the rest. So that is one side of traditionalism. The other side was a general cultural prevalence uh, or preference for satisfying only the traditional needs. So whatever was understood to be the prevailing set of uh, set, prevailing lifestyle, for instance, that this is what we normally eat, this is what we normally wear, this is these are the things on which we normally spend, and it is not worth the additional effort to work more in order to earn more. Because as long as one's basic needs were met, that is sufficient. That is a traditional attitude. And modern capitalism has to fight this. This is Weber's key argument. What is the traditional ethos that modern capitalism must overcome? On the one side, this 
uh, idea, this, this looking down upon making money, this must be fought. And the idea that one should only work as much as is required to meet one's normal needs. You don't need additional income, right? Additional income based upon additional work is not encouraged. That is, again, a traditional uh, attitude, okay? Modern capitalism must regard labor as if it was an absolute end in itself. A mere acquisitive instinct was not enough. It required a long process of education. This is Weber's key idea, why religion becomes, and for him, as we will see, religion is the new method of education. It is through religion, through the preaching and practicing of religion, that people are educated into the ethos of capitalism. It, because it is only through a new religion that this traditional idea, which clearly had the backing of traditional religious practices, right? So the idea of charity, the idea of helping those who were poor and, the, and, and needy, right? All of this is part of traditional religion, almost in every part of the world, right? The, the, uh, those who happened to be wealthy, it was regarded an obligation that they must spend at least part of their wealth on helping others through charity. Uh, through feasts were another way of essentially redistributing this any large accumulation of wealth, right? That is traditional. But modern capitalism must regard labor as if it was an absolute end. Okay? In other words, work harder in order to earn more, in order to acquire more, a, a, a higher income. This is against traditional cultural values. And this is something modern capitalism had to establish. Weber's question is, how did it do this? How did it educate people into this new ethos? And Weber's answer is that it did this through the spread of a new religion, the, the new Protestant religions. And it happened only in Europe. So what is this ideal type, this new ideal type of the entrepreneur that emerges? Small entrepreneurs who did not consume all that they had earned produced the spirit of capitalism. They existed for their business, not the reverse. Okay, so this is the idea of a poll that you exist for your business, for your profession, for your calling. The occupation does not exist for you, you exist for the occupation. This ideal type of the capitalist entrepreneur avoids ostentation or enjoyment of power, is embarrassed by social recognition, is ascetic, modest, and has an irrational sense of having done his job well. Now, you, you have to look at why Weber identifies this as irrational. Because on the one hand, it is an ethic which says you work harder in order to earn more, but you do not spend that additional income on enjoyment. You do not enjoy that, the fruits of that, that additional labor. You do not consume, right? You live life almost like an ascetic. In fact, Weber will call this a worldly asceticism. This is not the ascetic of the monk, right, who withdraws from social life. This is not a sannyasi's life, but an ascetic 
who lives in society, who works as a calling, who works because it is a duty to work, and who, and as we'll see, why does you know what are the fruits of that work? You have to earn wealth, you make wealth, but you do not spend that wealth in luxuries, in enjoyment. This is the peculiar ethos that capitalism has to create. And Weber's question is, how can this peculiar uh, ethos be established in society, even among a, a section of the, of the leading groups in society? How, how can that happen? You see, you may be reminded here of Adam Smith's example when he's talking about how, for instance, in traditional feudal societies, when you have wealthy uh, landlords with a lot of retainers and so on. And Smith was saying that this traditional landlord with a lot of retainers, the, the uh, income that the landlords had from rents and so on and so forth was in a sense redistributed among a lot of people who really had who were unproductive, unproductive, but who subsisted on the uh, wealth of the landlord because it was a tradition. This is tradition. It was a traditional duty of the landlord to keep these very large numbers of useless retainers around because that was supposed to be prestigious, right? But the economic function was that ordinary people, poorer people were subsisted on this. What Faber is pointing out that this is, this could not be the foundation of the new capitalist system. Capitalism had to get rid of this traditional idea. Okay, how can that happen? This is still Weber's task to show. And what he's doing is he's constructing this ideal, this new ideal type. Now, don't make a mistake. This is still an ideal type. He's not suggesting that all uh, you know, entrepreneurs were like this, behave like this. This is the, the, the goal of education. This is the goal of religious education to establish this as the ideal, the ideal uh, of society, the desirable, okay? So this is the key part of the argument, the rational consequences of irrational motives. Modern capitalism could not have resulted merely from the rationalization of social activities. Rationalization of social activities is actually a consequence of the establishment of a capitalist ethos. It's a consequence. So why is Weber making this argument? <clears throat> Weber is showing that rationalization had in fact happened in different aspects of European, European social life even before the rise of capitalism. <clears throat> so for instance, law was rationalized in the Catholic countries well before England. Voltaire was more popular in France uh, and uh, Italy than in England. The universalization of rationalism was caused by an irrational psychological motivation, right? It was not simply the fact that law had been rationalized, et cetera, et cetera, because that had happened even in Catholic countries. Something else had happened in the Protestant countries. This irrational motive had force only because it was religious obligation and not a purely secular or utilitarian calculation. This is the key idea that Weber is advancing here, that it required the force of religion to make this irrational motive, a general ethos in 
the new society. And then he makes a very important argument. And because if you do not remember this, you could be led to a lot of misinterpretation of Weber as has happened. Now that this spirit has become general in the West, religion is no longer necessary to support capitalism. So don't forget what Weber is emphasizing. Where is the role of religion? Uh, where was it important? It was important in explaining the origins, the origins, the unique origins in Europe of the spirit of modern capitalism. That lies in what Weber is identifying as the Protestant religions. Once capitalism becomes established, its spirit becomes general in the West, people from other cultures can now adapt to the spirit. It does not matter now, right, that the traditional religion of India or China or, or the Islamic world did not have anything like the Protestant India. It doesn't matter anymore because now those cultures can adapt. They can change their institutions. They can change their practices. They can educate their, their populations in the new ways of capital. Okay, it, it does not require religion anymore. Religion was required in that first, that initial crossing the hurdle, right? The hurdle of traditional religion. How was that first hurdle, historical hurdle crossed? That is where Weber is making his argument, right? All right, questions? So, as I pointed out, there were actually two parts to Weber's thesis. One is the actual consequences of the Reformation were of were unintended. The origin of the capitalist spirit lies in a particular strand of Protestantism. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that Weber is claiming that. Puritanism or Calvinism explicitly was intended to produce something like capitalism. That is not what he's saying. Okay. That capitalism resulted was an unintended consequence. The religion itself was motivated by different concerns. And we will come to what those concerns are. They were of different, they were different concerns, but the effect of that preaching, the effect of large sections or at least certain key sections of people, let's say in England and then Holland and other parts of Europe, uh, and then by extension, North America, uh, that they accepted that religion led to the social consequence, which was the emergence of capitalism, right? So be very careful in terms of uh, uh, understanding what, what Weber's claim is, right? He is actually making explicitly saying that the actual consequences were often unintended. This is not what was intended by the founders, you know, of, uh, you know, like people like Luther and Calvin and, and, and Knox and, and all of those other great uh, founders of the Protestant religion, they were not thinking in terms of you know, creating some kind of conditions for capitalism. That happens as an unintended consequence. So the first is to identify what is, what are those features? in the Protestantism, which contributes to this spirit of capitalism. And the second thesis is to show how those ideas become effective in history. Religion is shown to contribute to capitalism 
once again, and we will look at this more carefully later, Weber is very careful to say that this is not a full explanation of capitalism, right? It is only part of the explanation, but a, a key part, which is the extent to which religious ideas contribute to the emergence of capitalism. Okay, there, he is not disputing the fact that there are other institutional uh, factors, um, which, you know, for instance, Marxists would call material. He's not disputing that, right? But he is making this key argument that it requires a set of new ideas to enter and establish themselves in society for the capitalists uh, to be able to have the, the uh, persuasive power, right? Which would change traditional practices. So only cultural factors are considered here and not others. So the key idea is that of the calling and here the most general idea comes from Martin Luther, who of course is regarded as the uh, sort of founding figure of European Protestantism, <clears throat> late 15th century. A calling is a life task. That is a calling. So the Lutheran idea of calling was not to surpass worldly morality by monastic asceticism, right? In fact, Luther is, is rejecting the idea that in order to reach a high level of moral life, you must leave the worldly life and move into the monastery, which was the Catholic idea, that the monks were had achieved a much higher level of moral life than others, right? This is not what Luther is claiming. He is rejecting that idea. Monastic asceticism is not what should be aspired, uh, aspired to, but it was to fulfill the obligations imposed by one's position in the world. It is according to one's position in the world that you follow your obligations, your worldly obligations. And if you follow those obligations well, then that is a moral life. Renunciation is selfishness. This is very interesting, and it begins this, uh, you know, the critique of traditional morality, right? Renunciation, to renounce worldly life. In other words, if you were to translate this into uh, Indian terms, to become a sannyasi is selfish. Because it means not doing one's social duty. This is what Luther is emphasizing. Every legitimate calling has some worth in God's eyes. Legitimate callings, right? So being a thief is not a calling that, because that is not a legitimate occupation, but a, a socially legitimate occupation, even though it, it may, ha do, may, may have a, you know, not a very high rank in society. In, in terms of social worth, but it has worth in God's eyes. All right. So one of the key things, and you can you can see the sort of broad message of equality here in Protestantism, uh, a, a critique of traditional hierarchical orderings uh, in, in in feudal Europe, for instance. He is questioning the the foundations, the case the moral foundations by saying that no matter you know what one's station in life every legitimate calling has some worth in god's eyes so this is the first sort of <clears throat> definition of an idea of calling but it becomes it acquires a much more 
a much sharper and you might say a much more um, strictly defined sense in John Calvin, it's understood as Calvinism. Calvin in preaching in Switzerland, in Zurich, mainly uh, early 16th century. The doctrine, and here the doctrine is that of predestination. Now, predestination is the idea that God has designated a certain calling for every individual from birth, right? God has specifically given individuals a certain duty, a certain obligation. That is that person's destination, predestined. You don't choose anymore. It is given to you. So those who God predestines, he calls to do that which is God's, which is his duty or his glory. So here you will get a certain idea of the chosen people. Some people are chosen by God. And this is a very important uh, kind of <clears throat> idea which makes the distinction between between the ideal and the normal. Calvinism actually preaches that God has specifically identified or chosen some people to do or to project God's glory. Others, God actually condemns into a low state of life, a worthless state of life. Why God chooses some and not others is not for human beings to know. Inscrutable reasons. One cannot understand, one cannot discover the reasons that God has for choosing some people for a calling and for basically condemning others for their sins, right? And withholds his mercy from those people that he condemns. Why he does this in some cases and, and for others, what is the basis for this is not for human beings to know or discover, okay? Now, this leads to what is widely understood in, in Christianity as the theodicy problem. Theodicy problem is to explain why, if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, why is there suffering in the world? Why are some people clearly so unfortunate, right? Why are some people suddenly struck by disaster, right? Why are some people um, without even the means of subsistence? Why are some people sick and others not? And the answer, and, and the answer to this, you know, if, if there is a concept of an all-knowing, all-powerful God, then this becomes a key problem in, in such a religion to explain. Why in that case is God not merciful and remove all of these uh, sources of, of, of suffering? And this is understood as the theodicy problem, right? And there are different answers to this. I mean, the theodicy problem in the Indian case, for instance, is a widespread understanding of the doctrine of karma which basically says you, you are suffering in this world because of your sins in previous lives, right? And the, and the problem is, is uh, you can get around that problem by saying, well, if you lead a good life in this life, right? Then part of some of your sins will, you will make, uh, you will make this essentially crash it, right? You will undo, the results of those of those bad deeds in prior life, 
And in the next life, you will have a better condition of life. And this goes on, there's a whole cycle. But that's one way of it. In the European case, of course, there is no idea of rebirth and uh, karma, et cetera, et cetera. So there, the Calvinist answer to the theodicy problem is simply to make the, uh, the claim that God's reasons are inscrutable to humans, right? You simply cannot know. We cannot know why God does this. All that God, all whom God predestines is for the greater glory of God. It's, it's for God's reasons, but God predestines some people, okay? Now, what this results in is this idea that God's grace or mercy has nothing to do with personal merit. Doing one's duty is not for expatiation of sins, but only for the greater glory of God. Now, this is a very key argument in, 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 in what Weber is calling the uh, Protestant ethic, right? That you will do your duty or your calling not in the expectation of gaining some favors from God. You will not get anything or you cannot expect anything, right? There is no merit that you accumulate for which you will get some rewards. Doing one's duty is not for expatiation of sins. It's not that your prior sins will be removed. So there is complete elimination of salvation through the church or by good deeds, right? This is, this is a key idea, which is not traditional at all, which is completely opposed to traditional ideas of morality. You will not be saved by God through service to the church or by doing good deeds. Right? The world, there is no source of miracles or magic. Do this ritual and you will get this result. None of those kinds of things are of any use because the world does not have natural objects, the natural world has no room for miracles or magic or the intervention of God, the sort of uh, beneficial, merciful intervention of God. None of these things happen. This is what Weber calls with a famous phrase, which is repeated many times, the disenchantment of the world, right? Most traditional religions had an element of magic, and we'll, we'll come back to this when we uh, discuss Durkheim, had an element of magic. The idea that if, you know, that certain natural objects have certain powers, certain magical powers, right? And if you can manipulate those, those objects in the proper way, you will receive the benefits of that magical power, right? It could be trees, uh, some body of water, it could be all, all sorts of natural objects and so on and so forth. So for instance, we've we talked about fetishism, for instance, fetishism. This is precisely an aspect of, of, of the, the broader idea of magic, right? The manipulation of the uh, of the world in order to derive certain magical results. Uh, Calvinism, or what the, the version that we will call Puritanism, uh, completely removes this possibility. The world is, as Weber calls it, disenchanted. There is no enchantment in the world anymore. The elimination of the confession, which was a very strong and major part of the Catholic religion, right? That you go 
to the priest in private and confess to your sins. And if you confess to your sins, then God will forgive you. This is completely available. There is, in fact, there is no medium of the, the, the confessional priest anymore at all. Weber calls it the extreme inhumanity of this doctrine. This is an, a significant comment. I mean, Weber makes these comments very, very rarely. Very significant because, in a sense, what you will see is that Weber is by no means endorsing this religion because it was so effective in the uh, emergence of capitalism or a capitalist ethic, right? Weber is often read as being a kind of ideologue of uh, capitalism. He is by no means endorsing this ethic. In fact, this ideal type, right? of the capitalist ethic, he regards as extremely inhuman because clearly it, 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 it removes most of those aspects of traditional religious life, right? Which made the, which made bearable, which made possible for people to live with the sufferings and misfortunes of the world. Right? That is that has always been a part of all traditional religions. And what Calvinism is doing is completely eliminating that possibility. And this is where the specific version of the Calvinist religion, which you get in England, which is called Puritanism. And England, and of course, by extension, uh, North America, that is where we know historically uh, capitalism, modern capitalism emerges. So that's the connection that Weber is drawing. The Puritans were opposed to all sensuous and emotional elements in culture and religion. But by making a calling a dogmatically established an unemotional social activity. It facilitated the rational organization of society and gave it an objective and impersonal character. One could not even ask whether or not one was truly an elect. The elect are God's invisible church. So the understanding was that those who came to the Puritanical church. They were the elect. But you would never really know whether you are the, truly the elect or not. Right? You just simply had to assume that you were and behave accordingly. Right? You, you would behave in the way that God wants you to, which is all of those things that we have outlined earlier. Right? To to do your duty, your obligation to God by following your calling. So this is the Puritan ethic. For Calvinists, the only certainty was complete faith, intense ascetic action in a world and not mysticism. There is no mysticism. You don't retreat into, into solitude and contemplate or meditate. The only certainty was complete uh, faith in the intense ascetic action in the world, in the world. Man creates his own salvation. God helps those who help themselves. It's a famous sort of Puritan uh, phrase. Good works must be continuous and systematic. The Puritan personality has pur purposeful will and actively control and shuns spontaneous, impulsive enjoyment. Every Christian had to be a monk in mundane occupation. So the interesting uh, way in which Weber puts it, that you don't go into a monastery, but you live like a monk in 
mundane occupation. Right? This public notice that I put up here, this is this is from New England uh, in I think sometime in the 18th century. And and what it says is it prohibits the celebration of Christmas. It prohibits the celebration of Christmas, the exchanging of gifts and greeting, because uh, or the 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 dressing in fine clothing. All of these are publicly forbidden. These are satanical practices, right? Why? Because this is a festival which was obviously enjoyed by people. And enjoyment of something like the birth of Christ is, in fact, a sacrilege. So this is the puritanical ethic. This is the puritanical ethic. Now, look at some of the consequences of this. In terms of social practice, those who were not elected did not deserve sympathy, but hatred and contempt as enemies of God. What does it mean to say those who are not elect, for instance? Those who do not work, those who are lazy, those who are poor, do not deserve sympathy. Okay? This is the new dogma of the Puritan. Charity was bad. Charity was bad. This ethic led to a thoroughgoing Christianization of the whole of life. The thoroughgoing Christianization leads to thoroughgoing rationalization. This facilitated the rationalization of practical life by eliminating magic and superstition. All right? So this is, in fact, Mark the, 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 the claims that Weber is making here, right? He is arguing that the fight against magic and superstition, which was so much a part of traditional religion, could only have been made, right? Through this kind of religious ethic, which would be, held by people and practiced as a, a, a thoroughly disciplined uh, mode of existence. It is through ideas now, through the force of ideas, that this is held together. Okay, there's nothing else there. This is, this is what the claim is, that it is the dogmatic force of this idea that produces the ethic. Uh, Weber then goes on to specific, uh, we don't have to discuss this in detail, pietism, Methodism, Baptism, these are specific uh, non-conformist uh, movements, which later become specific sectarian churches, uh, with, you know, from um, in particularly English uh, and Scottish um, Protestantism. Uh, there are specific variations, but we don't have to go into the details, but broadly speaking, they all share the, what is understood as the Protestant ethic. The key ideas now, and this is what was so strongly emphasized in Franklin's autobiography, Waste of time is the worst sin. Now, how many times have you heard that? This is something that, as, as Faber says, that once it is established, successfully established in Western Europe, these elements of the new ethic uh, can be adapted and copied in lots of other places. Uh, so one of this, I'm sure you've heard this uh, from childhood, waste of time is the worst sin. Now, this is not traditional morality, right? In traditional morality, uh, you know, wasting time is not a particular 
sin at all. Uh, in fact, there is very often no concept of wasting time because the productive use of time in the sense that capitalism requires is a completely new innovation. Okay, uh, traditional idea would have been that if you manage to uh, get your life's necessities, your needs, you are satisfied, even without working, why should you work? Okay, continuous hard labor was the approved ascetic technique against sin, against sin. So this is, the, this is what Weber is insisting. Why should men work so many hours a day, even work an extra hour, right? You would do so because this was a technique against sin. Wasting time is a sin. Even the wealthy shall not eat without labor. This is a key idea. And so you will get among with, particularly with entrepreneurs, people who end up becoming very wealthy. And yet they would insist that they must continue to work, to labor. Now, this laboring need not mean manual labor, right? But work. Because even the wealthy must work. A man without a calling lacked the systematic method, methodical character of worldly asceticism. This is where the ideal becomes generalized. It applies both to the businessmen, the owners of capital, as well as to the laborer. Because the idea is that if you work more, right, you earn more. And if you earn more, that is a way to improving your conditions of life. Your children will be better off. Your children will have better opportunities. And that's the whole argument of social mobility, et cetera, et cetera, which will be uh, built into this new ethic of, of capitalism. That if you work hard, you improve your conditions in life and your future generations will be better off. If God shows one an opportunity for profit, to refuse it would be to reject God's will and his gifts, which are to be used for his purpose. Wealth is sinful only if it leads to idleness and sinful enjoyment, okay? So this is, this is a new definition now of, uh, of economic behavior, right? If you have an opportunity for making a profit, you must pursue it. You must make wealth, but you use that wealth not in order to become idle, and enjoy it in sinful ways, right? Wishing to be poor is derogatory to the glory of God, right? The person who says, I'm quite happy being poor, I don't need anything more, is actually insulting God. This is the religious force of this new ethic. Begging is slothful and a violation of the duty of brotherly love. One of the major things of the Puritan ethic and most of the Protestant religions is against begging. Begging is a violation of one's duty to others. You do not beg from others. And so the answer to theodicy then just as the presence of evil and suffering in the world was attributed to the inscrutability of God's reasons, so was poverty. Why is there poverty then in the world? We don't know. We don't know the reason. God has simply made some people poor from birth. God has given poverty to some people. 
not given enough opportunities to some people. The unequal distribution of goods was a special dis dispensation of divine providence whose, whose uh, ends were unknown to humans. Now, now, this is the explanation that Weber is providing for the origins. How is it that in one part of the world, right, even though those same conditions of, let's say, wealth accumulating in the hands of merchants and so on, gold and silver coming in, uh, large scale trade, et cetera, et cetera, including, for instance, if you think of Marx and primitive accumulation, the the uh, dis dispossession of uh, peasants from the land or artisans from their crafts and so on and so forth. Even those things may have happened at other places. We know various periods of history in other countries where you've had large scale economic disaster, uh, famines and so on, um, you know, agriculture um, collapsing, et cetera, et cetera. That did not necessarily lead to capitalism. Right? So Weber's key answer to why it was and how it was that capitalism originated lies in this explanation, that because of the rise of a certain religious movement among a certain class of people, right? These people turned wealth making and labor into a religious duty, okay? They created an entire set of moral uh, regulations, new moral regulations, completely different from traditional moral ideas. And that taking hold of a certain section of people, that leads to the rise of capitalism. Once that happens, once the origin is surpassed, now that capitalism is victorious in the West, it no longer needs the support of religion. And in fact, what Weber is, not, is observing, this was going to happen at a much greater speed in the 20th century. There would be a broad secularization, a secularization of, uh, of life. The secularization of education, the secularization of art, and culture, <clears throat> the secularization of the state, all of these things would, would in fact accompany and follow from the rise of capitalism, right? And so would become, would come to be regarded as parts of modern capitalist culture. Modern capitalist culture is supposedly secular. Weber is not denying this, but he's saying this can only be a consequence because the origin has now been surpassed. Right? It doesn't need that religion's uh, the support of religion anymore. Everyone must now live in an iron cage of work. Once again, the, the phrase iron cage, uh, Weber uses this and other places he uses it, the iron cage of modernity. So once again, Weber is extremely ambiguous uh, in terms of, you know, where in terms of approving this course of history, he is very, very ironical in, 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 in his use. So there is no choice anymore. Everyone must now live in an iron cage of work until the last ton of fossilized coal is burnt. Mark the phrase. You might even say prescient in some certain ways. He's perhaps seeing, looking at the future. We have no choice because his argument is that if someone in this, in this capitalist society chooses to say, I'm not going to work, that person will not survive, right? He chooses death in some sense. So we have no choice. The thesis of the Protestant ethic is thus one about the historical origins of modern Western capitalism. The religious ethic of Calvinism is not an abiding characteristic of capitalism. So once again, be careful to understand what 
famous claim is about the Protestant ethic. It is about the origin of capitalism as a spirit, as, as a set of cultural ideas that takes hold in a certain part of the world at a certain point of time. Once it is successful in transforming through this religious education, through preaching and so on, in transforming the general practices, cultural practices, which happens through the 19th century, let us say, in England, uh, then it no longer needs that religious, uh, that set of religious ethic uh, ideas anymore. So finally, if you broadly review the various debates over this book in the last more than a hundred years or so. So one is this question of which comes first, the spirit of capitalism or the capitalist system, the ideas or the material condition, right? This is the big debate, Weber, Weberians versus Marxists. Okay, is this a chicken and egg problem? You can think about this. Weber did claim that without ascetic Protestantism, the systematic character of modern capitalism would not have appeared in the West as it did not in China or India. So this is a claim that Weber is making, that without ascetic Protestantism, this, this systematic character of modern capitalism would not have come about uh, in the West. The Marxist would place the causal burden on the specific contradictions in the breakdown of the feudal system in England. And of course, there's a whole a debate which is known as the transition debate, the transition from feudalism to capitalism. There's a whole series of, um, you know, back and forth uh, over this. Uh, Marxists argue that the beliefs and practices of Protestantism were reflections of material conditions and were probably rationalizations of, uh, of those material conditions. So there is this whole argument, which, which is more basic as it were, the material or the, uh, or the, uh, or the explanation in terms of ideas. Vivarians, of course, dispute this. On the other hand, Marxists generally approve of the secular rationality of bourgeois culture. Weber actually may be read as lamenting the loss of spontaneous enjoyment in the iron cage of capitalism, right? So there is, you can think of, uh, of that difference too, because Weber clearly uh, makes a whole series of uh, remarks in, in various places where he, he talks about the inhumanity of this uh, ethical idea, this moral idea. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's frowning upon sort of spontaneous enjoyment uh, and so on. Uh, Weber clearly does not approve that, of that. So those are, have, have remained the sort of terms of the debate between Weberians and, and Marxists. And very often uh, people have ignored the much more specific um, formulations of the, uh, of the exercise that Weber carried out in this book. Because as I have tried to point out, Weber was quite careful in, in uh, pointing out the limits of his exercise, what, what were the precise questions that he was trying to answer that he felt had not been answered in terms of, especially he, 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 he was completely aware of, uh, of the arguments of Marx as well as uh, Marxists in his time. He speaks about the possibilities of socialism and so on and so forth. There are, there are lots of uh, discussions that he has on that question. Uh, but what Weber clearly found inadequate in the Marxist analysis was 
uh, a lack of understanding or a lack of explanation of that impetus. How is it? I mean, basically, you could you can talk about um, you know merchants who find this opportunity, which is provided, let us say, in England, uh, because of the of the or the wool trade in Europe, and then suddenly land is available. Um, landlords are willing to enclose the farms and and give them out on these to the gentleman farmers, and that leads to accumulation and so on. See, there is you can you can talk about all of those specific conditions, right? What Weber would still say: How would you explain? some merchants, because merchants have always been around, but merchants never adopted this uh, view of their enterprise, where they said, I will not spend or consume in luxuries what I earn as profits. I will not do this because I must save accumulate and invest again in order to make even greater profits. Why will you make greater profits if you are not going to consume it? Because you must continue to do it because otherwise if you did not in the world of competition, you would lose out. You would be eliminated. So you must keep on doing this. Weber's key question was, how would you explain the first set of people who embark on this? How, why did they want to do it? Why did they want? Why did they not like merchants throughout history? Right? You know, um, buy luxuries, you know, a huge, uh, you know, uh, a rich lifestyle, entertain people. Uh, invest in, in, in culture and so on and so forth, as merchants always did. Uh, why did they not do this and instead turn to this kind of continuing accumulation in order to invest again? This is what Weber feels requires the explanation and the explanation can only be provided, according to him, by the spread of a religion which makes this apparently irrational activity a religious duty. Without that force, it could never have achieved the level of success that you did. This is the key argument that Weber is making in this book. Okay, so questions, we can have a little bit of discussion. Um, if nobody asks, then I'll go first. Please, Pardon. please, go ahead. So I'm curious about Weber uh, and the Jesuits, for example, because ah. he doesn't talk about, uh, I mean, he does actually, he does go to the Basque country, but I wonder what he has to say, because after the counter-reformation, uh, yes. the Catholicism also changes and takes Correct. on... Yeah, so I was wondering. But that is, that is, of course, historically, Weber, Weber would be completely comfortable with that argument. It's the counter revolution. Uh, it's the counter reformation, right? The, the Reformation has already achieved that, that, that point of origin. So now, from then onwards, you have a, a whole range of people, including the, what happens in the Catholic countries, right? Attempting to emulate what has uh, happened. Happen. in Protestant countries. As you can make the argument about, you know, what happens in India in, in the late 19th century or in China, let us say. And of course, in the 20th century, it happens everywhere, right? Why, you know, you could, I mean, lots of people think of the standard ways in which, for instance, uh, the sort of religious reform movements in 19th century India are understood. Uh, you know, as something like the Brahmo religion or, or the Arya Samaj and so on, uh, understood ex essentially as this kind of reformist idea where a certain, once again, you can refer it as a kind of 
Protestantism as a kind of worldly asceticism, right? Do not renounce the world, but in the world, a way in which you lead your life where you are not ostentatious, right? You do not waste time. You, uh, you encourage uh, productive labor. All of these things are, are, are things that uh, other cultures then uh, try to, um, to inculcate, and very often in the form of reformed religious movements, right? So that would be completely consistent with what, what Weber is, is saying. Thank you, Bartha. Thanks. Everybody seems... Uh, I, uh, I was wondering, uh, may I ask a question? Mm. Yeah, so I was wondering that uh, uh, as we were reading Marx and we saw there uh, uh, at that time when there was feudalism and then uh, we were shifting from feudalism to capitalism and as you said that uh, to the uh, to the rural poor agrarian people uh, to those communities they had to lose uh, their means of production their land everything yes. so now they don't have anything uh, in their own hands yes. uh, but but uh, it is said that it is the a progressive phase of capitalism that where you can say no to uh, that i don't want to do one anything Right. right. So, but at the same time, on the other hand, religious religion would say, tell you that you have to work. Yes. Otherwise, it would be a sin. Yes. So this is a very interesting double game, I, I, I think. Yeah, that is true. But see, what 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 the interesting thing is at the one on the one side, of course, you have the purely formal uh, position of freedom of choice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you have the free labor. Mm. Now, the free laborer, the key argument of the uh, institutional uh, feature of the free laborer is that no laborer is obligated to work for any employer. You can change employment, mm. right? You can change your employment. You can move from one employer to the other. And of course, legally speaking, there's nothing stopping you from uh, not working at all. Mm. But look at the other uh, features, especially in this early phase, early 19, the laws of vagabondage, laws against vagabondage. Mm. People who have no employment or no fixed uh, residence, they are under surveillance because they are suspected of crime. So if you have no work, if you have no regular income, how do you subsist? Correct? And the assumption is, well, you must, therefore, you must be stealing. You, you, know, you, must, indulge, you must be indulging in some kind of crime. Otherwise, how, how, do you, how do you continue to live? Right? So you immediately become suspect uh, of resorting to essentially illegal means of uh, subsistence. So this whole question of crime in becomes connected with unemployment, with conditions. So essentially what you have, what do you have? You have precisely Protestant church organization, which set up poor houses, houses for where people without work are given work, right? They are put into these poor houses or workhouses where they are made to work and they are given food and a place to stay. Okay, this is done through church organization. Right? Once again, to make the or to, to basically to reassert the claim that labor is a duty. Labor is a duty that to claim to live in society without doing any labor is in fact sinful, right? So this is, this is the, the kind of argument. So on the one side, you have the purely formal legal position, which is that everybody is free, 
Now, the freedom essentially consists of your right to choose your employer. You can choose, unlike the feudal system, for instance, where you are bound, bonded to a particular landlord or lord, whatever. But you have to choose. Yeah. So here you have to choose. Yeah. So you could go from one employer to another, whoever is needed. And in fact, that sets up, technically speaking, within the capitalist system, a competitive system. So mm -hmm. if there is a shortage of laborers, right, your wage rates will increase because there is a greater demand for labor, laborers. And so, and then laborer, this would lead to mobility of labor. So labor would move to those areas where there is a demand for, for labor. So this will break the, once again, think of what the social consequences are. This will break traditional ties mm. of labor to some place, the, the ties of laborers to their own, their traditional place is always mediated through some community support or through the support of some landlord or some other you know, rich person with whom they were, their traditional occupations were tied. Now this will break because if, if, for instance, now it becomes a duty to say, well, you know there is, there is work available there and they are offering more wages. Mm. Why should you not go? Mm. Okay, so the traditional attachment would break, people would move. Now you see this, you know, this is, this is something you can see even, even happening today. You know, it, it, you can see it happening even in the last sort of last few decades. When you see, for instance, if you think of, 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 of West Bengal today, the number of people who move for work, long distances. This would never have happened, you know, 50 years ago. Because 50 years ago, people simply did not have the sense that it was possible to do it. And in fact, you would earn more and improve conditions at, in your, at, at home and your family because you move you know, to a different part of the country, you earn a lot more, you send back money, right? So, these, these, so a lot of the traditional uh, immobilities of labor will break. All of this is, is contributing to the basic workings of, of a capitalist system. Correct, but what is crucial is, and Weber keeps insisting on this, is the the obstacle of a traditional way of life mm. that has to be broken, and it keeps being broken this in this way, you know, both on the part of the wealthy merchant communities and on the part of the laboring community. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering whether we can say that uh, Weber is influenced by the Hegelian understanding of history because he is focusing much more on the ideas that are working as the guiding force of history or historical changes. Can we say this, that he is influenced by Hegel? Well, Weber does not actually speak approvingly of Hegel, as far as I, as far as I know, uh, of course he would have been aware of this. He was very much a product of 19th century Germany, right? That was his education. But he moves, <coughs> you know, he is writing after Marx, so that intervention is already taking place. So when Weber is writing in the 1890s onwards. Uh, that is already a period when that entire set of um, claims about modernity and, and the move from a, a Hegelian understanding of history to a, a more, uh, you might, on the one side, the liberal understanding of history as history as progress, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which was a utilitarian, liberal, English way of, of, of thinking. And on the other side, you have the socialist understandings uh, of moving towards a, the solidarity of workers, 
the organized strength of workers uh, of actually surmounting, surpassing the capitalist system to move to some form of common ownership of the means of production, right? Some kind of form of socialism. There were different ways in which these claims were made. The communists made one kind of claim, but on the other hand, you already had the emergence of some kind of democratic socialism by the time uh, Weber's mature period, you know, just before or during the World War. In fact, Weber has an interesting book called The Russian Revolution, which is on the 1905 revolution in, in Russia, uh, which is an interesting book. Uh, so Weber and Weber himself entered politics. He was elected, I think, to the German assembly or something uh, at one point of them, just after the war, soon before he, he died. And he was, in his political views, he was more or less, you, you might say, a kind of uh, a, a socialist liberal sort of socialist leaning liberal uh, politician. But I don't think he had specifically an argument about uh, about Hegel. You see, the the idea of, of you know the question of ideas and history is something that emerges in this phase of uh, Weber's work, on especially concerning religion, religion of India, China, etc. This is one point: the sociology of religion. Uh, Weber has a whole set of other works, which is been put together in terms of these two volumes called Economy and Society. An Economy and Society is, or, or General Economic History is another book, um, General Economic History. These are specifically about economic institutions uh, and the institutions of the state. Uh, there, there you do not have any argument about the primacy of idea necessarily, okay? He does talk about rationalization, which he does believe is the broad tendency in European history uh, in this period, moving towards a certain rationalization. The emergence of rational bureaucracy is a very key argument that he's making. But in, in that argument about rational bureaucracy, he's not necessarily saying that this is because of some uh, dominance of ideas necessarily. No, he's not saying that. The I you see. Be very careful in terms of understanding Weber's quite specific ways of formulating questions and then answering them. This will be very key to his method, right? A certain precision in, and so this is the way in which he's interpreting, right? But in, a, in what he would regard as a scientific way. Uh, and that is to isolate those elements that are relevant to the formulation of a specific question so that other elements can be uh, defined out of the problem. If you focus on a few, right, a small set of elements uh, which have causal effect, which have a, a, a causal uh, role in explaining that particular phenomenon. Uh, and that has to be formulated in a precise way, okay? That is key to Weber's method. Uh, we will look at this later on, for instance, when we, uh, we will read a little bit from uh, Economy and Society, which is his discussion on the types of legitimate authority in society. Again, typologies are important for him, uh, but uh, it's not necessarily an argument about the the uh, uh, influence of ideas on. So, you know, it would be wrong to think of Weber because that is how the Weberian versus Marxist debates have posed. You know, the kind of uh, a, a usual way of saying that Weber is in, looks, always looks at ideas and the privacy of ideas. That is not necessarily his position. Um, Parsuda, I have one last question. Yes, please. Un unless the students want to go and ask, because I can ask Parsuda at other times. Anyone? 
So I, we, could I, have actually, we could have more than one last question. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So I wanted to uh, ask about uh, how does Web Weaver kind of explain or think of the sublime when, uh, because he's thinking of, rash, you know, when we're talking about the- You see, there's a very interesting yeah. essay uh, Weber has on music. Uh -huh. right? it, it's, it's a relatively short essay where he's speaking of precisely this uh, rationalization of music, uh, classical music in the West, okay? And it's a, it's a very technical thing and I don't necessarily understand the whole thing. I don't know the, the technicalities of Western music that well. But uh, what he's saying is that the key uh, feature aspect of Western classical music, which does not exist anywhere else, is the rationalization of harmony. Harmony as understood in almost a mathematical way, so that you can even you know, the way in which you think of, of, of counterpoints, for instance, and so on, and arrange a, a, a the harmonization of music. There is a mathematical way in which you could do it. And then he says, but this is not what exhausts the uh, quality of music. Because even, and he gives examples, I, I, I don't have the technical ability to uh, understand this, this, this demonstration. But what he's saying is that even with the most perfect harmonization the, in the best uh, pieces of music, you will have melody breaking through. You will have melody breaking through. And that is what makes that piece of music memorable, it, it, it memorable in terms of its enjoyment. So what he's saying is, and again, he goes back, if you think of this whole idea of the iron cage and so on, in all of these things, Weber seems to be making the argument. I don't know that he has specifically used the idea of the sublime in the way in which, let's say, Karl yeah. have done. Uh, or, or earlier, you have works. I'm thinking of the romantics as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, I don't know whether whether there is some. I have not read everything uh, of, of, of Weber, so I don't know if if he has some place where he speaks talks about the sublime. But this is one essay that I know where he is basically saying that even with the most thorough rationalization of music for music to be truly enjoyable, something has to Break exceed. Through. Something yeah. has to exceed that rationalization. Uh, this is, you know, when you come to, for instance, things like, uh, we, we will return to this on, when we talk about um, legitimate authority, rationalized, rational authority, which Weber clearly says is the key to the modern state. That it, oh, above everything else, in, you know, the, the various things that are said in political theory, what is, what is crucial is the emergence of a rational bureaucracy. This rational bureaucracy is, is, is different from the way in which bureaucracy existed in other places. And he speaks about the bureaucracy in China and the bureaucracy in India uh, and, uh, and the bureaucracy within the church and so on and so forth. But Rational bureaucracy of the modern European state uh, as a form of authority, characteristic of the modern state, the modern capitalist in the capitalist era, is what is crucial uh, in terms of Weber. But then he again, within that, he speaks about how it was possible for charismatic leadership to emerge, right. even in, in, in the modern state. And as we can see, this is uh this is there and of course Weber did not live live to see fascism and, and Nazism in, in Germany but I don't think he would have been surprised uh that this remained a possibility even in one of the most rationalized bureaucratic states uh such as Germany for charismatic authority to emerge in this way so um so you know Weber does clearly is uh, not only has room for it, one sometimes has the idea that he almost uh, uh, 
revels in the possibility of, of, of something exceeding and mm -hmm. the, the rational. Although I'm sure he was aware of the, of the dangers of that as well. Yeah. Clearly, he, he was. He was. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Prasada. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? No. I guess. So shall we, Rajushi, shall we? Yeah, yeah. I think we okay. should just uh, shut the recording down. Yes. And uh, Aditi, we have got your uh, email about your ailment and I've just responded.